Joe en Paul, dat is toch een paar knieken, brabrilla Joe en Paul, dat weet je, bully krieken, brabrilla zoet, hij koopt, hij giet een zolen perfect, hij vet een dag hier, kuiven, door bij Joe en Paul. Now the reason I played that that first one of Joe and Paul in a, a, a Yiddish uh, ad is because the word Ubermensch was used today by a, a, a historian of some repute who I've never heard of, Doug Brinkley, who referred to Ted Kennedy as a form of Ubermensch. And uh, of course, if you hear the word Ubermensch, you immediately think of Untermensch. And if you know what an Untermensch is, why then immediately you think of uh, Joe and Paul for some reason. At least that's how my mind works. I don't know about yours. I don't know how in the world they can call Ted Kennedy an Ubermensch without understanding that it means someone else who is not an Ubermensch is an Untermensch. And of course, then you have moved into the uh, the lexicon of uh, old Adolf. How could a great liberal historian such as Doug Brinkley, who I've never heard of, refer to Ted Kennedy as a form of Ubermensch? Did you hear this? Listen to this. Play the fact it. of having dogs with him and playing catch all the time and uh, going to see Ted Kennedy always felt like you were going to see a, a kind of uh, Ubermensch. He was so uh, nice uh, to young uh, people. Uh, uh. And of he, course, okay, we got it. Ubermensch. And of course, the talk show host from MSNBC, who was a nobody, snickered at that. That sounded good. The word Ubermensch made him happy because it sounded smart and somehow sophisticated. And while he himself doesn't know what the word means, he knows that Anyone as esteemed as Doug Brinkley, whoever he may be, is much smarter than him, and therefore it's certainly worthy of a snicker, which is what they all do on MSNBC. They, they, they snicker a lot, all except for Pat Buchanan, who never snickered. He just stepped on people's arches uh, in, in uh, grade school. So here we are. What would you like to talk about? Play the Philip Morris thing for me. I'm not in the mood to do politics right now. I think I'll do nostalgia. I think I figured out why I've been banned in Britain. It may not actually be statements that they said I, I made, which I didn't make. It could be because I wrote um, Psychological Nudity. And in Psychological Nudity, there are stories that could be offensive to the uh, Obermensch of uh, Britain, the liberals of Britain. For example, there is the, the story of the tough high school geometry teacher with two fingers on his right hand, who was a tough guy, and he was an Irishman. And... There may be a reason that the British banned me that is related to this story, for all I know. And then, of course, I wrote about happy and sad cufflinks that I had as a child. And that could be offensive to a liberal government when you think about it. Because if you put children on Prozac, they're neither happy nor sad. They're flatlined all the time, so they can be easily manipulated by Gordon Brown. And so, therefore, if I write a story called happy and sad cufflinks, and I remind people that we actually have emotions once we throw our drugs away... That's a threat to a liberal uh, nation, and that could be a reason I was banned in Britain. And so I'm looking through the stories now, and I think I'm going to next purge some of these stories in an attempt to be taken off the list, banned in Britain. Here's another one. When Tippy was, my dog Tippy died and was thrown into a garbage truck on page 21. Now, that's offensive to a liberal, and I think that that may be the reason I'm banned in Britain. What if I read that in England? What if I'd gone on a book tour in England and read Tippy dies and is thrown into a garbage truck? That could be a shock to the British today. Uh, dead man's pants. There you go again. Making a mockery of uh, using clothing from dead people. And somehow that's offensive to the dead. So that has to go out of the story. Here's another one. Nutty friend had crazy mother. You can't call anyone's mother crazy. Even though she beat herself on the hands and wrists with a chain and then told her his father that he did it in order to make the father fight the son. That could be offensive to a liberal government. Now, there's one arm Frank. Now, look at that story on page 43 of uh, Psychological Nudity. That could be the reason I was banned in Britain by the liberal government. Look at that story, one arm Frank. You can't say a thing like that in England today. It may offend people with uh, one arm. You have to pretend that there are no people with one arms, particularly those who came back from Afghanistan and Iraq who uh, lost their arms for no reason whatsoever. Then this one must have been. This could be the one. Half man, half woman in Long Beach. That unto itself could be the reason uh, that I was banned in Britain. And you never know. And then there's, of course, well, there are other stories in there that you may not want to read anymore. Because, Well, there's another one, the Islamists are winning. There you go. There's a reason for banning me from England. Islamists are winning. Here's another one. Plastic bags are banned in San Francisco, but not condoms. Now, that's a threat to the social order in a liberal government. That's another reason to ban the book. So I would suggest that you, uh, if you have a copy of this, you... I don't know, maybe you should bury it in your backyard with your guns 
Uh, because once they come for the Second Amendment, uh, once they win on that, they'll come for the First Amendment. Now, it is true they've already come for the First Amendment through their friends in England, but don't tell that to Glenn Beck or uh, Rush Limbaugh. They're acting as though they're the first victims because they've lost advertisers. Of course, what happens if you're actually banned by a nation? Oh, my God. Well, you don't talk about it if you're part of corporate America and part of corporate radio and television and corporate media. You certainly don't mention an, an actual talk show that was banned by a, a nation. So what would you like me to talk about? I'm just having fun today. That's all. It's summertime. I've got the summertime giddiness. Most normal people are not even listening to the radio today. If you're listening, it means you're not normal. It really, it really means that. If you're actually listening to this show on a hot Thursday, August 27, 2009, it means you probably have troubles in your life. Because actually, you should be somewhere. You should either be at Martha's Vineyard trying to get a look at, uh, at Obama somehow. Even if you can't see him, actually, you can say you almost saw somebody who, who saw him. Or you could be at the airport at Martha's Vineyard writing down the tail numbers of the planes that are not there, of the people from Goldman Sachs and uh, Citibank flying in and out to see what they can get out of the administration next. Um, you know, I mean, <clears throat> you could be doing things like that if you were. In a, but since you're not a normal person, you're listening to talk radio on a hot Thursday, uh, we can just talk amongst ourselves because we are not the ubermensch of, of the kind of uh, that uh, this Brinkley character talks about with Ted Kennedy. Or Howard Dean. He's certainly an Ubermensch. He would be. Wouldn't Howard Dean be an Ubermensch? Or Chuck Schumer's an Ubermensch. He's got big feet. I, is shoe size got something to do with Ubermensch or the amount of uh, alcohol that you can consume? What actually makes somebody an Ubermensch? Th this historian referred to Ted Kennedy as a form of Ubermensch when talking about him as a person. Would Chuck Schumer qualify as an Ubermensch because of his shoe size? Would Howard Dean qualify as an Ubermensch because of his. Well, let's leave it go at that. It is a family show. And now we have Arianna Huffington, another wonderful prize lover of the poor, even though she herself married a rich man in order to take his name and his money. Arianna Huffington talks about the death of Ted Kennedy and how it's a moral imperative to pass the health care reform for him. Now, why would Arianna Huffington, a woman who married for money and took the man's name, be caring so much about health care reform? Can anybody figure that out? Let's hear clip seven. Senator Kennedy passed the torch, the JFK torch, the, torch? the Kennedy torch. Wait a minute, did she say he passed the torch? But I thought this woman was a prize debater. Did she say that, he, that Ted Kennedy passed the torch? Can anyone call the show and tell me what a torch is? What in the world is a torch? Beowulf, do you know what a torch is? Play that again. I want to hear what a torch is. Senator Play Kennedy passed the torch, the JFK All right, yeah, she torch, passed the torch. torch onto she Obama. passed the torch. All right, take take a walk. Take a walk. You pretended you were a Republican uh, before you got married, and then yeah, after the money came flowing in, you got the name and the gelt, and then moved on, the gelt and the pelt, boom. And then we got we got a lot of things to talk about since we're uh, ubermensch. I mean, uh, not ubermensch. We can talk about these things. Here's Senator John McCain. Uh, yelling at a disruptive woman. Let's hear clip 14. Let's you're going to have to stop or you're going to have to leave. This, this woman right there, please. Goodbye. See ya. All right. that, that's heroic, John. Wow, that's heroic. That really makes you hot stuff. The McCain-Kennedy uh, immigration reform bill was, was really something too, John. That really helped your presidency. The McCain-Kennedy this bill, the McCain-Kennedy that bill... Uh, angry crowd at Virginia Town Hall goes nuts when Rep. Jim Moran demands to see an audience member's ID before allowing him to answer. Who is Jim Moran? Is he a D or an R? He's a D. Well, the Democrats have a, they have a right to ask for someone's ID. That's the way Obermensch do it. I mean, in, in Adolf's land, all of the Obermensch demanded to see uh, certain IDs and party membership. Why should Jim Moran not ask to see someone's ID at a town hall meeting? He's a Democrat. That's the way they work. Eventually, you're going to have to show a, a, a card, a, a, not a union card. I mean, a card, a party card, the way they did in old old Germany in the 30s. If you weren't a member of the party, you couldn't get a job. If you weren't a member of the party, uh, you couldn't vote. In fact, if you didn't have a party card, you were put on a railroad car to go work somewhere for nothing. So I can understand why Representative Jim Moran demands to see an audience member's ID card. Let's hear Jim Moran. Uh, <laughs> That's just screaming. No, no, please, those are people screaming at a politician, a Democrat. That's that's not permitted. 
Jim Moran said we wouldn't be going to war in Iraq if it weren't for Israel. After all, he knows these things. That's why he asks for uh, members' IDs before allowing them to ask a question. He's an Obermensch. See, there's Obermensch, and then there's the rest of us. And uh, if you're not an Obermensch, it means you're an Untermensch. And if you're an Untermensch, well, you know what happens to you, don't you? It's coming soon. I'll be right back. Savage. I'm still trying to figure out, does anybody know what a Dorch is? Because she's a, a member of the Obermensch class, and if she says Dorch, maybe it's a code word for the Dorchester Hotel and some code words about England. I, I don't get it. Did she say that he passed the Dorch? Let me hear that one more time. Senator Kennedy passed the Dorch. Dorch, see? The Dorch. Passed the Dorch. 